Tonight, has Australia's global reputation taken a hit? We'll look at the diplomatic cost of our feud with the French and cutting emissions the Australian way. Welcome to Q&A. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Virginia Trioli and we're coming to you live from Melbourne tonight. Joining me on the panel, Managing Editor of Climate and Capital Media, Blair Palazzi. Foreign Editor at The Australian, Greg Sheridan. Leader of The Australian Greens, Adam Bant. In Sydney, New South Wales Treasurer, Matt Keane. And in Glasgow, live from the COP26 Climate Summit, International Climate Justice Lawyer, Kavita Naidu. And it's great to have you all here. Good evening. Remember, you can stream us live on iview and all the socials. Quanda is the hashtag, so please join in the conversation. And we publish your comments on the screen from Facebook, Instagram and Twitter. Our first question tonight comes from Jennifer James. Scott Morrison lied to President Macron, either deliberately or through omission. Either way, trust between Australia and France has been broken. And Australia faces global scrutiny in the way it does business. So what must be done to repair trust between Australia, France and other nations? Let's uh, go around the, uh, the room, shall we, for everyone on this one. Blair? Well, I think Australia is facing a trust issue, not just on this, but on climate change. Our agreement before and arriving at Scotland was not seen as a Let's, sta let's stay with the question, though, which is about the, uh, sure, the relationship I, I, with France. I really believe that the France situation and, you know, arriving in Scotland, we aren't looking like a nation to be trusted and we will have to work hard. And that will require us really to make commitments that are real, uh, whether it's climate or whether it's agreements we're making with other countries in order to win that back. Greg Sheridan? So, Virginia, I don't think uh, Morrison lied to uh, Macron beyond conducting nuclear, sensitive nuclear negotiations confidentially. A bit like when Henry Kissinger opened to China. He didn't tell everyone about it while he was having the sensitive talks with China. I don't think he told any specific lie to Macron. I think the great breach of uh, protocol is Macron calling him a liar at an international conference. But the world is not actually that fussed about that. The French do that with all the Anglo-Saxons. I mean, the way they talk about Boris Johnson makes Scott Morrison look like their best friend. What I think is damaging to Australia's reputation quite seriously is inadvertent damage from President Joe Biden's comments casting doubt on AUKUS. And secondly, just this look that our whole submarine saga is just the greatest fiasco. I've covered national security since Bob Hawke, since Malcolm Fraser, and in that time, the only Prime Minister who has commissioned a submarine which has come into existence is Bob Hawke. And I think we look ridiculous at that level. We'll get to a little more on that, but I want to hear from Adam Bant on that, because Greg Sheridan's saying there was no lie. I think it has damaged our reputation and I'd be inclined to believe President Macron over Scott Morrison, given his track record when it comes to the truth. I think there needs to be... We can get into the subs issue in a moment and we've got a very clear position that we think this is a terrible, um, terrible move, but putting that to one side for a moment, I think now there needs to be an apology and Scott Morrison needs to work together with uh, President Macron and other EU leaders on climate, because this has damaged Australia's reputation. Countries are now saying at Glasgow, well, if you can't trust what Australia says, and if the, if the Prime Minister is going to leak your text messages to the media when you're having discussions between heads of state, how can we trust them on climate? How can we trust them on other issues? And when we're facing such a global crisis, that's a terrible position to be in. Matt Keane? Virginia, I think the substantive decision was the right one in our national interest. But France is a long-term friend of an ally of ours and we needed to handle that decision in a respectful, honest and transparent way. And that clearly didn't happen. So I think our international reputation is damaged and that relationship is too important for us not to work hard to repair it. What do you think, Kavita? I'm not concerned about reputations at all of either Australia or France. For me, any form of militarism and the billions and trillions that are being poured in that infrastructure by any of the developed countries is a huge problem because that money can be better used to address climate change. 
Let, let's get to that bigger issue, though, of the subs deal that we've signed on to here, 20 years before we get anything. And in the meantime, a clear signal also, really, when we think about it, to China that we are weak on defence, that we are without that for those 20 years before we get something in the water. There are many other clearly bigger mistakes in this issue that have been made. Greg Sheridan seems to indicate that too. Do you agree, Blair? I think Australia really does have to worry about its reputation and that the steps we take internationally are really important to that trust issue on all the issues of concern and that in particular with submarines, you know, you can't dis you take it out of the equation of our region, China in particular, what that says in terms of uh, siding with Biden potentially going offside for France and, and leaving us in a situation where we don't look like we are statesmanlike internationally. Greg um, mentioned Biden and America throwing us under the bus there or indeed calling into question the AUKUS agreement. Mm. You organised for Joe Biden, so uh, you, we, you have a personal a, commitment. As an you? intern at 12 years old. But he's a, he's a very honourable man. I think he's come in with a very strong agenda. He's achieved a lot in a very short time. He's got a lot more to do. Uh, but I think, you know, it is important for Australia to build trust both with the US, China and mm. France uh, and not to pick sides and certainly not to play games. And I feel like it seems as if we're trying to play games and we're achieving nothing. Greg, do, do you really think it doesn't matter that someone like the, the... has the standing of Emmanuel Macron out and out calls our Prime Minister a liar? I think it does matter. I think it's very damaging for Macron's reputation. I mean, it's an extraordinary <laughs> thing to do, to go to an That's international That's a nice conference. way to twist it, Greg Sheridan. <laughs> no, 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 but to go to an international summit of leaders where you've lost a $90 billion contract and say, as a result... You know, this person who I thought I loved is now an unspeakable swine and a liar. And I've never discussed pineapples with him. And then the guy says, hey, but I've got a text that says you discuss pineapples with... But to be honest with you, Virginia, you know, I don't want to break any secrets here or disappoint anybody, but having done international journalism for 40 years... I find that governments leak on each other all the time, that, constantly. They, they, they do, but you made another point about that when you wrote about that the other day. But let's get there via this question. We have one that goes to the issue of text, and it comes from Stratos Pavlis. To me, that text from French President Macron to ScoMo was in the form of a question about the subdeal. Are we getting good news or bad? If he knew it was off, then well, why bother asking? My question, however, is about the tactic of leaking the text. Is any country going to trust us as a partner when the Prime Minister treats international diplomacy on the same level as a schoolyard spat about who said what in a text? Kavita, I want to go to you first, even though I know you think it's not the main game. What's your response there to Stratus' question? I think both Australia and France need to recognise what this also means for the Pacific region. I mean, these are countries that have been former colonisers in the region and weekly history has left permanent damage. And, you know, a lot, number of the Pacific countries are still very wary. And, in fact, you know, this, this whole um, diplomatic spat that's, that, that's going on currently, it's... it's it's, it's not looking as if this is going to be moving in a direction that's going to be helpful in terms of the redress that the Pacific Islands are seeking, which is, you know, really making a stand against any form of militarization in the region. But we all are aware that the Pacific, given its geographical location, is becoming more and more dominant in the geopolitics between the Western allies and China and how they want to use that region for these purposes. So mm. this is a worry for the Pacific. Um, and it needs to be solved. Matt Keane, the specifics of the question are, um, and he, he uh, suggests, Stratos, that because the, the text said, are we getting good news or bad, that if he knew that the deal was off, then why would he bother asking the question? Is any country going to trust us as a partner when the Prime Minister acts this way? Matt Keane? Well, I don't think it's appropriate that we act this way if we want to build trust, particularly with our closest friends and allies. And I think this brand of politics is not in our national interest, a brand of politics which seeks to divide, seeks to play things out through the media, seeks to push misinformation and play games. I think we need to be finding common ground and building trust with our allies and friends. And that's the new brand of politics which I think is in our national interest, Virginia.
Adam Baird? Well, it takes a fair bit to unite the French, the British, the Americans and the Pacific Islanders against you all in one week, but that's what Scott Morrison has done. He's managed to stab the French in the back over subs and stab the Americans and the British and the Pacific Islanders in the front over climate. This week has been... Scott Morrison's been a one-man wrecking ball this week and it has made it that much harder to tackle the global challenges that we're facing and also to look our Pacific Island neighbours in the eye and say we are acting in your interest on both defence and on climate. We've got some specific questions coming up on the Pacific region, which I know you'll be interested in, but Greg Sheridan, you mentioned before that, you know, hey, no surprise, um, over 40 years of carrying this, of course, uh, countries and leaders might leak this stuff. But you also said in that Australian comment piece on that point, in general, the cleverer the government, the more subtle and the less obvious is the leaking. So you're saying the Australian government's not so smart in this well, respect? Well, um, it's a different case when someone says, you're a liar, I never discussed X, Y, Z. No, we're talking here about and the state. leaking, though. I mean, Absolutely. The, the cleverer but, the government, the more... I mean, you don't leave a trail of breadcrumbs back to yourself. No, no, in general, in general, you don't. Absolutely. And I, I've been the recipient of leaks from Australian governments and foreign governments about Australia. And, look, I mean, if no country did business with another because it leaked against them, no business would ever be done. But I'm saying in the case where somebody calls you a liar, there's a specific sort of exemption for saying, well, look, here's the evidence. And, of course, he didn't know that the deal was off, but he knew that the deal was under consideration. We had delayed moving to the next phase of the French uh, agreement for we, six we, months. But we, we, so, we turned up to meetings and we'd smile for the cameras and, and, uh, yeah. and, and shook hands and said, yep, it's all on, what, three weeks before the AUKUS announcement? A absolutely. Was on. But French naval group officials, company officers, talked to me about whether the deal would go ahead or not because of the six month delay. Now, as I say, when you have a secret negotiation, so when Kissinger opened up to China, he didn't tell the other American allies. It was very embarrassing for Billy McMahon because America's policy up to that moment was we won't recognise communist China and neither should our allies. But Kissinger couldn't have conducted those negotiations if he'd told every ally about it in the world because he couldn't have kept them secret. So it's natural that Morrison had these negotiations in secret. But honestly... Oh, I, think, I think it's a little differently than actually just stepping in and telling someone you're signed a deal with, you're not going ahead with it. That's a, Yeah, but, but a we, very we, the deal was structured as a series of contracts. And when you get to the end of stage one, you can decide whether you go to stage two. That was clear when the deal was first struck. And we got to the end of a stage and we didn't proceed to the next stage. Let me just ask a quick question before we move on. If you had to categorise how clumsy and how clumsily handled this has been, how would you categorise well, that? Well, look, my fellow panellists want to talk about climate rather than, than texts. I want to talk about subs rather than texts. I think the clumsiness of this diplomacy, it was clumsy, but it doesn't really matter a hill of beans. But our inability to produce a submarine for our national defence since the 1980s... I mean, Harvard... MBA courses should study Australian submarine policy as a world-class, epic cluster mess of dysfunctional <laughs> policy, never resolving itself. I am not going to live to see the next Australian submarine. My newborn grandson is already too old to serve on an Australian nuclear submarine. I think Adam Bant's probably happy about that, <laughs> given you don't well, like I think them. We've, we've contracted out our mm. defence policy, effectively. We've just said, at a time of escalating tensions in the region, um, we are, we're, we're, Australia should be playing the role in the region of trying to de-escalate tensions between the US and China. Mm. We've just said we are going to contract out, as an island nation, we are going to contract out our defence policy to the United States, even if it means we might not have, as Greg Sheridan said, submarines for a very long time. And we're purchasing these nuclear-powered submarines, these floating Chernobyls that are aimed at, you know, travelling longer distances. Well, why? Are we all of a sudden now just uncritically joining the aggressor in any future wars. This isn't about what's in Australia's interest. This is about uncritically handing over decisions in a way that I think will make Australia less safe. Matt Keane, how do you repair the relationship? 
Well, I think it's going to take a long-term investment. Uh, but what we know with France is that we have a lot of common values. I mean, we stood shoulder to shoulder with the French in world wars. But we also have a lot of common interests. I mean, climate change is the biggest challenge of our time. And we need to both be working to solve these things in a way that's going to grow our prosperity for both our economies. So we are aligned on those issues. We're aligned on uh, those common values that we share. And let's not forget, the French have millions of people living in our region. Uh, they're a major military power and they're a major voice in Europe. So we have every interest to repair this relationship if we're going to make sure that we're going to be, continue to be a global player. Let's go to our next question. It comes from Stuart Sweeney. COP26 primarily brings together nations and political leaders in order to develop plans and actions to deal with global warming. This is akin to a gathering of the referees rather than the main players in the economic game. Shouldn't we have a gathering of the corporations and CEOs of the polluting companies in order to develop the transformative plans that we really need to deal effectively with global warming? Thank you, Stuart. Kavita, I'll come to you first. Would that be a more productive and meaningful meeting? I'm sorry, but I missed... The, the question dropped a little bit on my end. That's so fine. would you I mind can, just repeating that? Yes, I can, I can help you at my end. Shouldn't we have a gathering of the corporations and the CEOs of the polluting companies in order to develop the transformative plans that we really need to deal effectively with global warming? So rather than having, it, as he put it, the, the referees rather than the main players in the economic game, what do you think? Well, the corporates and the fossil fuel industries are actually taking over the entire Glasgow <laughs> COP space here in any case. I mean, Santos is the sponsor for the Australian Pavilion. They are running the show. So, of course, their contribution would be immense if they stop fossil fuel production or end financing for it. So if that's what they're talking about, then great. But we don't see that happening. What's it like over there, Kavita? Give us a sense of, of how you're experiencing it and whether it is, it is landing as meaningful to you. All of us who are engaging in this process as civil society can see how frustrating this process is because we are not being given the access to meaningfully participate in a lot of these discussions, but we're doing what we can in order to really influence and shape these negotiations and the text to make sure that it really centres down on humanity. At the end of the day, climate action is about saving our existential, you know, our, our very own existence, which means we have to talk about protecting the most marginalised communities around the world. We have to talk about making sure that finances are actually being used for climate adaptation and resilience, and that there is finances coming in from loss and damages, which is the irreversible damage that most of us in the Pacific are now facing. We are no longer in a position to be able to just build more seawalls. Um, we are actually being displayed from the very uh, communities that we've been living in for generations. And so these are the conversations that we need to be having. But you can see that the narrative and the rhetoric is so heavily co-opted by corporations just pushing forth greenwashing and false solutions. Um, and that is a huge problem. That is a huge problem in this space right now. A surprise announcement was made this evening from COP26, an international agreement to accelerate the end of coal, the world's single biggest source of emissions, of course. 18 additional countries have joined, so it's now 190 countries and organisations, including Poland, which is Europe's most coal-dependent nation. US, India, China uh, and, of course, Australia did not sign on. Um, where does that leave us? Once again, out in the cold, uh, Australia repeatedly says no thank you when it comes to the incredible opportunities that are in the move from coal and gas and into the innovation and low carbon and no carbon. I mean, this is, without a doubt, the world's biggest economic opportunity uh, this century. It will make the dot-com boom look like a little blip. It's massive in size and scale. And we repeatedly say, no, thank you. We're not interested. We'll sit away from the table. We'll let others make decisions. We won't get in the game. It'll start hitting our economic uh, opportunities very soon. And it's dangerous. But for those sitting at home watching this and, and engaging in this conversation, for whom it is you know, very, very important, when they repeatedly see that you get uh, countries like India, China, the United States and Australia not signing on to those things, 
What does such an agreement really mean? Uh, the United States is in there, and for us to say China and India are on par with the United States is simply not true. They're developing right. countries that are coming much more quickly to the table than many countries like we are who have had 150, 200 years in the fossil fuel game. It is on, the onus is on us as developing countries to speed up that process, to mm. put the money in and to help and offer opportunities. But in that is our own opportunity. Uh, where will Australia's economy be if we don't get into this? Uh, where will our jobs be? It will not be in coal and gas mining. What will our children do in 20 years? The question is up to us, but at the moment, this government is not interested in a $130 trillion opportunity uh, that will, you know, you'll only look to somebody like Andrew Forrest who sees the opportunity. Uh, many businesses in this country do. Some are thinking of going offshore. That's I, dangerous. I think it even goes further than that. Like it's the, the question was raised a really good point about the power of the big corporations. Coal and gas are the major causes of the climate crisis we're facing. Right? It's burning of coal and gas. Coal and gas are the next asbestos. Now, we have to get out of coal and gas. And that has been the whole point of this, this COP conference, this global summit, has been um, the US has led a process to say, let's cut gas because gas is as dirty as coal. And others like the UK have led a process to say, let's get out of coal. And mm -hmm. Australia has played a spoiler role. I mean, Scott Morrison has been a cigarette salesman in a cancer ward at this conference. Like, the whole world is saying we need to get out of coal and gas and they are signing pledges to do it and Australia is turning up and Scott Morrison is giving them the middle finger. And then he says, well, what about China? China's polluting a lot and so on. Scott Morrison is siding Australia with China and Russia and Saudi Arabia. Like, there, are, there is a coalition of the climate concerned from the US and the UK trying to corral these other countries and Australia is turning up saying we're siding with them. And the question was about the corporations is spot on. Like, yes, there's, there's uh, 100 corporations that are responsible for 71% of the world's greenhouse pollution. But the role of government should be to regulate the corporations. But instead, it's the other way around. They're making donations to the government. They're sponsoring the pavilions that, that we have at these conferences. And they're getting to write the policies. And so Australia is now a handbrake on world action. I want to come to Matt Keane in a second. And Matt Keane is here, of course, as a representative of a coalition government. But I do want to point out that we did invite a range of federal government voices to join this discussion this evening. And I'm feeling their absence keenly. And uh, we... The invitations included Barnaby Joyce, Angus Taylor, Dan Tehan, Keith Pitt, Susan Lee, Bridget McKenzie, Zed Seselja and James Patterson. And I'm afraid they all declined us. So I just want to note that they certainly had their opportunity to be here this evening. But Matt Keane, what's your response to that question? And, and in particular to, to the role of regulation in either constraining or dealing with the corporations? Well, if we're going to limit global warming to safe uh, limits, uh, then everyone is going to need to lean into this, including the private sector. And what I want to see is private companies being able to make legally binding commitments under the international framework. So I think the ability for the private sector, for private capital, uh, to participate in conferences like this, to make legally binding commitments under international frameworks can only be a good thing. I mean, we need more people taking steps to reduce our emissions, not less. We need our super funds investing in things that are going to uh, support the rollout of renewables at scale. We need mums and dads looking to put solar on their rooftops and batteries on their garages, for example. We need everyone doing their bit if we're going to meet the biggest challenge of our time, and that is limiting global warming to a safe level. Let's go to our next question. It comes from Jaden Yunan. At the forefront of Australia's climate policy is major investment in energy technology, which the federal government has claimed under their slogan, technology, not taxes. However, according to the Australian Institute, the research design and development budget for energy technology has drastically fallen since 2013. In fact, its latest figure within 2019 marked a record low for Australia in the 21st century. Without taxes or a credible history of investment in energy technology, how are any countries on the world stage supposed to comprehend, understand or even trust the Australian way of tackling climate change? I'll come back to you, Matt Keane, um, as a coalition government member. What's your answer to the question there? 
Well, firstly, I'd say uh, the states and territories around Australia are leading the way when it comes to reducing our emissions. And three of those... That's not really the way it's supposed to be, though, is it, when we have a Commonwealth <laughs> well, government? Three of those governments are Liberal or coalition governments. The second thing I'd say is that uh, no country on the planet is better placed to benefit from the transition to a low-carbon future than Australia. And we should be embracing this uh, transition, not just because we care about the future of our planet, but also because we care about the future of our economy. I mean, a transition to a low-carbon future means jobs in Australia, investment coming into this country, and prosperity like we've never seen before. Mm. So we need to grab this opportunity with both hands because the race is on. And if we miss it, we're going to become a rust-bucket country. I think that's right, but... But we've also got to stop opening up new coal and gas mines. Mm. Like there's, we are, Australia is going to Glasgow and under Liberal and Labor governments around the country, we are opening it. There's over 100 new coal and gas mines in the investment pipeline at the moment. When your house they're, they're, is on they're, they're fire... They're probably not all going to be um, open and established, but, yes, there are 100. But in, in New South Wales... There's no, there's, Adam, there's no Adam, basis that all of them will be. But in New South Wales... I'll, I'll come back to you, Matt, but go, go, go ahead, Adam. I mean, Matt's doing... Terrific stuff in, on renewables in New South Wales, and we support it. But they've opened up five new coal mines in the last year, right? And there's those, the, the coal mines in Labor states in Queensland, in Liberal states in New South Wales. Like we are pouring petrol on the fire. When, you're ha when your house is on fire, you don't pour petrol okay, well, on well, it. OK, well, let's hear so how, how, how do you justify that, Matt Keane? Well, the reality is that... Um, Every country under the Paris Agreement is responsible for its own Scope 1 and Scope 2 emissions. And here in New South Wales, we have plans in place that will see us reduce our emissions up there with the most ambitious countries in the world. Based on our energy policies, which is the biggest renewable energy policy in the nation, we will see our emissions from New South Wales reduced between 47 and 52% by 2030. Now, that's up there with the most ambitious countries in the world. With regard to coal mines, let's not, let's not think that domestic policy makers are going to be able to do anything to save coal in this country. The reality is the future of, the, of coal is going to be determined by foreign governments and foreign companies. And right now, those foreign governments and foreign companies are moving to a clean energy future. So we need to be doing, uh, rather than investing in the technologies of the past, investing in the opportunities of the future to make sure we set ourselves up to grab those enormous economic opportunities that are going to come with a low carbon future for but the world. But given that you believe that, and given that the federal government there and the prime minister in Glasgow has not signed up to the methane pledge and has not signed up to the elimination of coal pledge, and in fact is still speaking about that being a part of the energy mix for some time to come, how frustrated are you by this? Are you feeling let down by your Commonwealth colleagues? No, I'm not, because what we should be doing is identifying opportunities to reduce our emissions that grow our economy. That's what we've done here in New South Wales. We've formed a new brand of politics... No, my, 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 question, my question went to your Coalition colleagues in the Commonwealth, the Federal Government. Sure. You must be feeling frustrated by that. It's clearly not... They're not decisions you'd be making. I think the Commonwealth Government should be doing a lot better because it's not only in the nation's environmental interest to do so, it's in our economic interest to do so. Uh, not winning the race uh, to provide the clean energy of the future, the materials that the rest of the world is going to need to decarbonise, will mm. come at the expense of Australian jobs and opportunities. So I'm arguing that a coalition government, a coalition government that always talks about not leaving the next generation with financial debt, should also leave the next generation, uh, should not leave the next generation with environmental debt. That's what conservatives should always be about. And that's why I'm encouraging the federal government to do better when it comes to tackling climate change. I just, can I just you, you go ahead? Matt, you know, the, absolutely right behind the state stepping up and without that, where would Australia be in many ways, economically as well as uh, in our climate policy? But the truth is, without federal leadership and a really clear market signal, even your business and economic uh, talk about, you know, other countries, etc. You know, people going offshore and the punishment we may receive, whether it's a carbon border tax or being left out of green trading zones because we're not at the table, we're not committing to a methane agreement, we're not agreeing to uh, pull back our coal, and we haven't even talked about exports. Uh, you know, exports, as it doesn't even get covered in, in the kind of COP uh, we're talking about now, but should. Uh, and to say that whether countries just continue to buy what we put out there it's just not good enough from a developing country point of view, and it will stand in the way of our moving on. I mean, you can't keep 
to a foot in both camps, is my feeling. Yeah. Well, and Australia continues to try to play this game yeah. of having one foot in fossil fuels and one in It's a drug another. dealer's defence. If Absolutely. we don't sell it to you, someone, someone else, else will. Someone else will do it, and it's not good yeah. enough. Well, let, let, me, let, let, me, let me just ask some questions on those issues, particularly on exports. Greg Sheridan, um, how should Australia respond when developed nations put a tax on fossil fuel e um, exports? Well, I think or imports to them? That's just outrageous protectionism. But if I could just make a couple of but points. But they probably Virginia. will. Yeah, I mean, that's probably uh, going to happen it's at some not, point. Not at all clear. Um, first but of all... But do you want to talk about what, what, how, what Australia's response should be if and when that happens? Because I think people here on this panel believe it's probably sooner rather than later, given the way everyone's scaling that down. Well, let me put it in context. Uh, first of all, I think the federal government makes a tremendous mistake in not appearing on Q&A. They're losing the argument. They should be putting the argument whenever they can. I think it's incredibly dumb of them not to have Could you a let them know that when here. you're next speaker? Well, to I'm <laughs> telling them right now. Okay. This is really <laughs> stupid, fellas. Secondly, I disagree with a lot of the things that have just been said in the last five or ten minutes, and if we had another five or ten minutes, I could provide an, an alternative narrative. Um, we're going to cut our emissions by 35% by 2030. If we reconvene this program in 2030, you'll f I bet you'll find that Australia has done well. Uh, people in Australia constantly say the rest of the world is doing this. No, it's not. When, when they say the rest of the world, they typically leave out Asia. I tell you, quite a big part of the world is constituted by China, India, Indonesia, Thailand. I, I was in, in Indonesia once and a, a green Australian reporter was trying to ask the Indonesian government would they ever put on a carbon tax. Indonesia has fuel subsidies. They pay people to burn carbon. Yeah, but we they don't... They don't, but they don't no, 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 wait a minute. We're in on. the middle of so a climate Adam, crisis and we've been quiet right here and allowing people to finish sentences. That's an argument for the rest sentences. of the world that, to do more, not for that, Australia to do less. So, look, fellas, I mean, well, I get, I'm an endangered species here. <laughs> By conservation <laughs> rules, you should let me finish a sentence, you know? <laughs> now, I, I think there is enormous uh, dishonesty and hypocrisy in all of this stuff. There's also a question of what really benefits the planet. If you are a rich industrialised country and you abolish your aluminium industry, you can probably reduce your national emissions by 10%. The aluminium industry goes to China, which produces aluminium under much laxer environmental conditions, and the global emissions go up. So you can pat yourself on the back. That's all that Europe has done. In the 20 years of this, we've moved as a planet from 87% of our energy coming from fossil fuels to 83%. Now, if the rest of the world is doing this and only Australia is the bad guy, there's no evidence for that. And my final point is, whatever is happening, we are not the handbrake. I love Australia more than anyone, but Australia is not the centre of the world. Our no, but we do failing need to talk to about go, what our commitments yeah, might but be, our, our failing to go from 35% in 2030 to 45% means 10% of our emissions, which is 0.1 of 1%. China's increase in coal... Right now, because of its current energy crisis, China said today has increased one percent of the global emissions. Dying to leap in, I'll go to, I'll go to Matt first, then I'll come to you, Blair, then I'll go to you, uh, Adam. Go, Matt. <laughs> Greg, people like you are just apologists for uh, our environmental destruction. So that's, uh, that's a like really you sophisticated in the comment, way. Matt. People Glad like that you, you don't are standing in the way let, let, let of our environment. People like you are standing in the way of grabbing these enormous economic opportunities. And you need to I'm get out of you the don't way. Play You're the on the wrong man. side let, of let history finish. here, Greg. You're on the wrong side of history here, Greg. And that's what a I'm saying Marxist is comment. that what we need... You, you talk about aluminium smelters. Well, let me tell you, the biggest aluminium smelter in New South Wales is Tomago. They produce, they, they take about 12% or use about 12% of the state's electricity. And when we announced our renewable energy roadmap, they put out a statement saying this is exactly what they need to secure their long-term prosperity and sustainability in Australia. It means that they can stay open and operating, supporting thousands of jobs in the Hunter into the long term. So it's just a nonsense argument that you're making. The reality is I didn't the rest of the world... Let, let but, but how am I making an argument about Tomago? I didn't that mention have underwritten Tomago. Our prosperity for generations are changing the types of energy and resources that they want from Australia and we're really well placed to provide it and people like you should get out of the way and allow us to do it. I want to hear from Blair. Well, I think it's also a complete furphy to say that Asia is uh, nothing but expansion on fossil fuels. 
anything but. Uh, Which, China, of course, I didn't say. You just said that Asia uh, no, no, was going to continue No, I said they're not doing coal. what you're saying. You said everybody is getting out of fossil fuel energy. But you, and today, not. China announced that it will not go back on its, on its climate commitments and it will not go for more coal. So anything that's being built it's in the short term... It's producing 200 million tonnes more. And it's ready to start pulling it back. At, with a net zero commitment by 2060, with clear a 37-point plan that was discussed over the last two weeks, not with media, but with businesses. Why? Because they want to make the case that they will be at the table, they will be in making the transition, and it, it is, I believe, uh, China's way to geopolitically play a stronger role internationally. I just want to ask, uh, uh, we'll have to move on to the next question and you'll get plenty of opportunities, Adam, I promise you. But, but before we move on, I wanted to ask you specifically, Greg, China's absence there from the meeting today, what do you think might be going on there? I mean, it's being interpreted, of course, as, you know, as grossly arrogant, that not, them not being there. But could it be that there's some inner turmoil going on behind the scenes and some wrestling internally in China over this? issue? It's possible, Virginia. I think there are three factors that are obvious. First is they are COVID obsessive. Xi Jinping makes Donald Trump look like, um, you know, Paul Hogan as a germaphobe. I mean, he is, he hasn't travelled anywhere for 600 days. He's isolated in Beijing. Happens to a lot of one-man dictators, but he's very scared of COVID. He doesn't move, okay. move outside the country. Secondly, there does seem to be some internal toing and froing because they've had a different line publicly in the last couple of months. So they responded much less to AUKUS than most uh, of our domestic critics and than most people were, yeah. were predicting. And then thirdly, you know, I am not going to play the man or the woman on this panel, but I'd say to you, Blair, if you believe the Chinese government's promises on anything, there are six million Hong Kongers I'd like to introduce you to and a few million Uyghurs who could tell you about a couple of promises that Beijing hasn't delivered on. Yeah, but China... Let's, let's go to our next question. Our next question comes from Elisa Pesci, Massivesi. We in the Pacific region are amongst the most vulnerable to climate change, including in my country, Fiji. Countries like Fiji have not been major carbon emitters, yet we will be hard hit by climate change. More than 10 years ago, countries like Australia committed to providing $100 billion annually to support low-income countries to adapt to these growing impacts. This week at COP26, Australia committed to increase its contribution by $500 million to $2 billion over five years. Yet, the Overseas Development Institute has estimated Australia's fair share at about $4 billion annually. At the same time, Prime Minister Morrison refused to set a credible emission reduction target for 2030. Does Australia really expect Pacific leaders to be satisfied with these announcements? Let's go to you, um, Kavita, if we can, particularly given you're there in Glasgow and um, you are a Pacific delegate there in Glasgow as well. What's your response? Uh, Elisabeth is absolutely right. Australia is the pariah here right now because it has not enhanced its ambitions since 2015 and most countries are really stepping up to making sure that by 2030, so in the next decade, we see some real reductions in emissions. And Australia is not giving that at all. We're just playing with numbers here, like 25%, 35%. The fact is, it needs to do it by 75%. If there's any chance of us to keep this temperature to 1.5, you know, we're just being thrown numbers and a 30-year timeline in those 30 years, Pacific Islanders will be living on boats. So the reality is that much imminent for us in the Pacific, which is why the numbers don't add up, they don't align with the science, and Australia's just not stepping up. And nobody is buying Australia's bullshit anymore. Everyone can see that Australia is lying about a lot of its accounting trips and carbon capture and storage. Nobody's buying it anymore. Adam Bad. Well, the, um, the COP that I went to that was hosted by Fiji, the Pacific Islanders were united in pleading with Australia not to open up new coal mines, the Adani coal mine. That was their number one ask. And cut pollution by 2030, more than you're doing at the moment, and don't open up new coal mines. Not only has Australia continued to open up new coal mines, with Liberal and Labor support, I might add, we are now on the verge of opening up a new massive gas bomb in the Northern Territory, the Beetaloo Basin. Like, everyone's heard about Adani. 
Like, Beedaloo is going to make Adani look like a fart in a bathtub. Like, it is, it is massive. It will increase Australia's emissions alone by about 13%. We, at the time when everyone else is trying to phase it out, Labor and Liberal, uh, coming back to Greg's point about subsidies, Labor and Liberal are taking public money that could be going to schools and hospitals and giving it to big corporations to open up new coal and gas mines in the time of climate crisis. This is criminal. We should be giving aid to countries in the Pacific because... Australia and Australian corporations are responsible for some of the damage. And instead, we have this bipartisan agreement between Liberal and Labor to take public money and give it to big corporations who pay no tax and get them to fuel the climate crisis and make it worse. It is no wonder that our Pacific Island neighbours are looking to us and saying to our Australian Prime Minister, are you trying to kill us? Because that is what is happening. Homes are already being inundated well, and me, their whole countries and homes could be wiped out. Well, let and me, we let are me saying, quote. Labor and Liberal are saying, we don't care, we'll open up more coal and gas. Let me quote Fiji Prime Minister Bani Marama, who was actually speaking at the COP. Opening coal plants shuts the door on the future of low-lying Pacific nations. Whether you burn it yourself or export it to others, coal has no place in this century. Uh, what should be the, the proper response here, Matt Keane? Well, I think we should be good friends to our neighbours. And if we want our neighbours to stand by us on the issues we care about, and let me just say this firstly, Virginia, um, we're seeing the Chinese Communist Party ex trying to expand their influence through the Pacific, through yes. their Belt and mm. Road initiative. Um, just like we, sh we want our Pacific friends and neighbours uh, to be concerned about the issues that we're concerned about, so too should we be concerned about the issues that they're concerned about. And clearly climate change is an issue that they are very worried about and we should be doing everything we can to be good neighbours and good friends to those uh, nations in the Pacific. Greg Sharon, I, I know that you're a big believer in our leadership role in the Pacific and have particular concerns, as uh, Matt mentioned, many do, about Chinese expansion there as well. What should we be saying to our neighbours and, and how should we be, behave, be behaving towards them when they, they do express this exiden, existential fear about their own existence? Well, I agree that the Pacific should be an absolute top priority for Australian policy, an absolute top priority. I think we should be very generous financially. We have a different view about climate change and, of course, it would be an irony if, because they were annoyed with us over climate change, they threw themselves into the arms of China. But we that, don't... That we, but do, do we, as Australia, do we really have a different view? We don't anymore, do we? Looking at them and saying, um, you're not being inundated because of climate change, it's no, something else. No, no, I didn't mean that. that. I didn't mean okay. that. No, no, no. What I meant was we have a different view about the consequence of Australian having a coal mining industry. For example, uh, if a tonne of Chinese coal is displaced by a tonne of Australian coal, there are fewer greenhouse gas emissions as a consequence. So, therefore... That's just the, the drug dealers the, 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 <laughs> Someone uh, else will get it, well, get it from the, someone the, else. The, 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 the truth to, is... The science so, is we need to Adam, keep it I'm in the ground. I'm glad the Greens we believe in free speech for everyone who We're is a, a member discussion. of the Greens. For everyone who We're is a member of the Greens. Yes, but you do, you do have to let Greg finish his point, though, Adam. Yeah, and so we have a different view with the of the South Pacific about the efficacy of our own actions and the consequences of them. But they ought to be our top national priority. We should always listen to them. I think Scott Morrison, in a sense, has been not bad with the Pacific. If we get into emissions trading, then we should buy all the emissions that the South Pacific sells. Nobody else should be in the market and we should be their, their, uh, their partner. But having said all that, that doesn't mean that because they think we ought not to have a coal industry, that we ought not to have a coal industry. Um, I just want to read to you something that came to us from the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. Uh, they mentioned to, or put out a media release today, saying Australia is proud to join two declarations that called for urgent climate change action, which reaffirm climate change remains the single greatest threat to the peoples of the Pacific. So they've, they've reaffirmed that. But as you say, the difference about whether to use or not use coal definitely remains. Blair? Yeah, I think our, the onus is absolutely politically on us, not only to listen to the Pacific and to care about their concern about um, the impact that our emissions and the world's emissions are having on their very existence. But I think, Greg, 
uh, makes an important point, which is uh, they will begin to potentially look to partner with countries like China if Australia isn't in a position to listen to them, to act on the kind of mm. action and be taken seriously, and believably so, uh, to take on that. And what I have heard this week, uh, unlike what Greg was referring to about Chinese briefings on climate, is that Xi Jinping sees this as his opportunity to play soft politics around the world That's and right. to use the money and the influence they have to move into areas like Africa, Pacific, Southeast Asia, and other countries. As, as they've been doing for, for some time. But more but so with use climate as the you know, lever to do so. The way by, to do so. By, by by providing aid, assistance to transition into clean technologies. Before we move on, I just quickly wanted to get a response. Maybe I'll go to, to you, Matt Keen, on this one. The Greenpeace report that came out just in the last few days that showed or claimed that Australia used bullying tactics in regional negotiations on climate change, that it tried to use its power and aid money to dilute the official communique from the Pacific Islands Forum in 2015, 16 and 19. Uh, what should, how, uh, do you believe that's credible, first of all, and what should Australia's response to that be? Well, no, I don't. Again, you know, Australia should be leading the way when it comes to taking action on climate change because the cost of us not doing so is going to be enormous. Just ask the farmers in New South Wales who had to have their water shipped in, uh, trucked in, because of the worst drought in living memory. Just ask the family that lost their house in the black summer bushfires on the south coast. Just ask the tourist operator on the Great Barrier Reef. There is a huge cost to our nation in not taking action on climate change. But let me just say, there is also a huge opportunity for our nation in taking action on climate change and leading the way. We know that the markets that take our coal are changing the type of resources they want from this country. We're really well placed to provide it and there's a race on. And if we don't get at the front of that race, we're going to be left behind. Mm. And the opportunities to provide the world with green steel or green aluminium or green cement or green hydrogen are going to be filled by other capitalist nations that are going to enjoy the prosperity that we're about to miss out on. So this is not an economic environmental imperative alone. It's an economic one. So we should be moving because it's in our nation's economic interest to do so. Let's go to our next question, and it comes from Tyrone Delisle. My question is for Adam Bant. I'm the spokesperson for Greens for Nuclear Energy Australia, a group of Greens members and supporters calling on the party to change its position on nuclear energy. The IPCC and the European Union Joint Research Centre, among other peak scientific bodies, have found that nuclear energy is as safe as solar and wind and has equal or lower life cycle emissions. Why then do the Greens continue to reject nuclear energy? Is it about transitioning the right way, as one European Greens MP suggested, rather than transitioning rapidly? Adam Band. Thanks, thanks, Tyrone. I mean, we've got... Firstly, it's too expensive. It'll be too long to get uh, uh, in action in Australia in the time that we need. And it's not safe. Like, it's, if you have an accident at a wind farm, it's a stiff freeze. If you have an accident at a nuclear power plant, it's Chernobyl, right? And we've got... We are blessed in Australia now with all of the sun and the wind and the technology that we need. We have the technology right now to make the transition. What concerns me is that a lot of the advocates... Uh, put Tyrone in this situation, but a lot of the advocates for nuclear... He's, he's a green advocate it's like, for nuclear. Yeah, but a, a lot of the other advocates for nuclear, it's the new distraction. It's like, oh, well, if you're really serious, you'd get well, involved I in I nuclear. I don't know if that's fair. I mean, you're talking there about a, a, a very dangerous uh, electricity generation idea, you say, that uh, is being relied upon by many European countries and has for decades now. So we've got, but, but we've now got a nuclear reactor sense. that's called the sun. We, and, it, it just a, and a lot of it's sense. shining down on Australia. And we could, like, with the technology that exists now... And this is the furphy of the government's technology, not taxes thing. Like, they're actually taking Australian people's taxes and giving it to comfort to the big coal and gas corporations to open up new coal and gas fields. But we have the technology now, right? It's not a question of technology. We've got it. What we need is a plan to pull coal and gas out and a plan to push this technology... Sure, but in. let's get to the question. So your, your um, answer is no because it's not safe. Too, too expensive... Mm too far away, not safe. And we don't need it. Like, okay, why well, in a country like... You, you... Let, me, let, me, let me go to Matt Keane, because, um, Matt Keane, I know that you said back in March that Australia could see small, modular nuclear reactors the size of a shipping container commercially available by the mid-2030s, uh, tw I'm sorry, and you said you hoped nuclear had a role to play in Australia's energy future. Do you still believe that? 
Well, let me tell you, by the time small modular nuclear reactors are commercially available, in New South Wales, we've lost already four of our five coal-fired power stations. So it's not a solution to meet our energy needs here in New South Wales. So you've changed, I... you've changed your mind on that? No, I'm obviously open to the opportunities and possibilities that new technology could deliver safe, clean, reliable energy from nuclear. But right now, people chasing nuclear are chasing a unicorn. <laughs> the reality is that uh, those people pushing this nuclear campaign are just trying to find an excuse to prolong the use of coal in our system. We know that the cheapest way to deliver electricity today is now a combination of wind, solar, battery and pumped hydro. That's the reality. So if you actually want cheap, reliable power, then you're not going anywhere near coal. You're certainly not going anywhere near nuclear. You're going towards renewables backed up by storage. And that's what we're doing here in New South Wales. Kavita, what's your view on this? I agree. I agree with both Adam um, and Matt. This nuclear is not the solution. There are many solutions that are being offered. This is the worst one. And also, if I could just... Sorry, I wasn't able to interject, being on Zoom, is everybody needs to stop commodifying the Pacific, OK? Not stop talking about market mechanisms and the economic models that literally exploit the Pacific even more. Buying off carbon credits from the Pacific has led to environment destruction and human rights violations through projects that are false. And this is the things that we are fighting against in Article 6 and carbon markets, that we cannot replicate those same systems by pushing false carbon market solutions, which is what Australia is notorious for in the region. And so, no, it is not about, OK, we'll look good by overachieving, which is a lie, and you push carbon market mechanisms in the Pacific, buying off forests, none of that matters right now because the only thing that matters is ending fossil fuels. No amount of replanting and carbon sequestration is going to add up unless we end fossil fuels. And please, really, this whole conversation about, OK, let's just put some money figures on what we can get out of the Pacific or give to the Pacific is just wrong. It's morally wrong. Okay. The Pacific is being bullied by Australia. The Pacific's, the aid that is coming to the Pacific from Australia is silencing Pacific governments from really stepping up and saying Australia is the criminal here. I just wanted to ask Greg Sheridan, though, on that question before we move on to our next one. Do you think there's ever going to be political appetite from any political party here for nuclear? What do you think? Well, uh, probably. I mean, I agree with Adam and Matt. Let me hasten to say energetically that uh, <laughs> nuclear You're is You're all going to give each other big hugs at the uh, end. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, COVID safe hugs. Um, <laughs> nuclear is not a short-term solution. But I'm not nuclear phobic. I think it is as safe as any other kind of energy overall. And, in fact, even in Chernobyl, very few people uh, actually died. And it gives oh you dear, base we're not going to go down that rabbit hole. It, goes, it <laughs> goes down... No, no, compared to, you know, the people who've died in coal mines over the years, I mean, surely you're not going to disagree with me about that. I think but, people could disagree but, about the horror that was Chernobyl, but, but Yeah, no, going. Chernobyl was horrible, but uh, given the breadth and range of the nuclear industry, it is very, very My question very, was very about safe. political appetite. Yeah. What do you reckon? So I think... I wouldn't have thought three months ago that we'd have bipartisan consensus in this country for nuclear submarines. I, I wouldn't have thought it. And I've been wrestling with that issue for many, many years. And, and lo and behold, we have. And lo and behold, we have. Mind you, it's, it's another unicorn. It's a typical Australian... All Australian <laughs> politics is like a speculative mining stock. <laughs> it's beautiful when it's pure speculation. The minute you try to dig up the ground, it's a disaster. But I do think there will probably come a point at which somebody will just say, probably a Labor government, because it's like Nixon goes to China, will just say, OK, let's do it. OK, let's move on to our next question. It comes from James Purcell. Hello there, my name is James. There's been a lot of hype recently about green hydrogen. Considering Australia's high wages, high energy costs, and the large cost to get green hydrogen to market, why would I, if I was someone in Europe, the UK, the USA, import Australian green energy when I can make it at home, follow the same industrial processes and get the same quality product? Interesting question. Blair, what do you reckon? Uh, the race is on for green hydrogen and Matt will attest to this and it is hard, it is expensive, it's, you know, technically challenging as to how we will create enough renewable energy to produce it, the technology we need to store it and transport it. Uh, 
at the moment, Andrew Forrest is spending more money than anyone in the world, any country, any company. There's a good chance he may be able to get ahead in the technological sense of pushing it fast enough and has the resources to be spending money in developing countries to place large-scale renewable uh, energy. But, can, but could Australia be as competitive? Uh, yes. If you, James are, question. if you are out front, if you are 15 years ahead of your competition, you absolutely can mm. be the country that, you know, Joe Biden put his hand out this week to Andrew Forrest to said, I wish you could do what you're doing in Australia, in America. Why? Because he's yeah. pushing ahead. Anyone else can do the same. Germany is well ahead. One but of the, the question... That Let's hear from Adam, and then, then I'll go to, um, to sure. Matt. That I think it was, it was James made. It was, you know, Australia has high energy costs. We don't need to. Right? We could be the country in the region that you bring your energy-intensive industries to because we produce a surplus of... Uh, clean, cheap electricity, right? We are blessed with sun and wind. And so if we had a mindset shift and decided to massively invest in energy generation, mm -hmm. we could drive the cost of energy in this country down to close to zero. And that's when things like green hydrogen and bringing energy intensive industries, whether it's data or green steel here, all of a sudden makes sense. And we are also really lucky because the areas um, down the east coast where we've got the capacity for green hydrogen and green steel are also the areas where a lot of coal and gas industries are at the moment. So it's the perfect transition to take someone from a high-paying job in coal and gas over to another form of manufacturing industry. What do you think, Matt Keane? I think this could be one of the biggest economic opportunities of, uh, that our country will ever see. We can be literally the Saudi Arabia of sun uh, because to produce hydrogen, you need very, very low-cost electricity. The only way you can get that is through renewables. And we've got the best renewable resources anywhere on the planet and some of the cheapest land in which to produce them. Mm. So it means we have a competitive advantage. And that means that we can export our clean energy to the rest of the world. We know Japan and South Korea have said hydrogen is going to be the key to replacing fossil fuels for their economies. So we need to make sure that we're winning the race to provide that green hydrogen uh, because that means jobs, that means investment and that means a rise in our living standards like we've never seen before. Mm. Hydrogen will also help our heavy industry to decarbonise. It will help ensure that we're able to continue to produce steel here, to produce aluminium and to do those energy intensive processes which we've seen disappearing offshore for generations now because we can produce that clean green energy onshore in a cost competitive way we'll see a manufacturing renaissance here in Australia like we've never seen before. I, I just want need to pick to up the, uh, the point that Tony Wood the Grattan Institute makes though in, in the most recent paper that he and his colleagues have put out and he like others you know they do not argue with the idea that of course it's environmentally important but also economically the benefits to to all of these transitions to sustainable uh, industries uh, is, is massive, but it's hard. He said he acknowledges it's hard, mm. it's difficult, it's costly, and the burden is disproportionately uh, borne by some rather than others. As someone arguing that from the Greens' perspective, don't you, Adam Bat, don't you need to actually start speaking in those terms? If you're going to really honestly bring people with you, you need to talk about how hard and costly this will be. Look, I, I've gone from coal towns from Lithgow to Muzzlebrook to Collie and held public meetings in the Workies Club and stood up and said, I'm, I'm here from the Greens, um, we want to get out of coal in 10 years and I want to talk to you about how we're going to do it. But and do, you, do you talk about how hard and expensive yeah, it is? Yeah, in fact, guys, you talk about you know, the, guys, the guys standing there in high-vis vests like with the arms folded as I'm speaking in the front row and then at the end they come up and say, look, don't agree with everything you say but at least you're being honest with us, right? Labor and Liberal are lying to people, saying we can keep coal and gas going forever. We're saying, no, coal and gas are the next asbestos. We thought for a while that we could keep them going. Now we know we can't. And so we want to talk to you about the transition. And we can do it. And we've seen transition done poorly in Australia. And we've seen it done well, and okay. we've got the lessons to learn. I can very quickly, if we really race, we can get through our last question. Our final question of the night comes from Stephanie Dalson. Matt Keane. You managed to wrangle the Nats and secure a greener climate deal for New South Wales. To the panel, if given the opportunity to represent the federal Australian government at COP26, what would be your one new actionable strategy to enable our nation to contribute to the one to two degree drop in the Earth's temperature that we need 
to hold a hot future. One actionable strategy. Kavita, go. <laughs> <laughs> wow, we've got such a list. The one, the main one would be um, stop approving any more coal mines and 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 and, and subsidising them. Okay. It needs to stop. Production Matt. and financing has to stop. Matt King. Have ambitious targets backed in by credible policies designed uh, in a way that brings people together from different political parties focused on our national interest, not on vested interests. Adam Bant. Well, I think we are heading to a minority parliament at the next election and we'd have the Greens in balance of power. <clears throat> We'd be pushing to phase out coal We're and gas. We're optimistic tonight. 75 per cent emissions cuts by 2030 because that is what we need to meet that one and a half degree goal that our Pacific Island neighbours are asking for. Greg Sheridan. So the Virginia voters showed that voters don't do as they're told and they don't always vote on climate change and I'd be surprised if the Greens do as well as Adam says. Journalists never represent government, so I'd be there causing trouble. <laughs> OK. Flay? I think send a really clear market signal. Stop dithering around. Be very clear that we're going to go take our foot out of the fossil fuel world and into the opportunities of the future and partnerships. We live in a region where we can play an important role, not just the Pacific, but Southeast Asia. We can be a global leader. We just have to choose to do it. Well, that's all we have time for. So thanks to our panel, Blair Palazzi, Greg Sheridan, Adam Bant, in Sydney, Matt Keane, and all the way over in Glasgow, Kavita Naidu. Thank you so much for being with us. And thank you for all of your terrific questions tonight. Next week, Stan Grant will be with you live from Sydney. And I can't believe it, but our live studio audience will return. And you can join me tomorrow morning on ABC Radio Melbourne. Stay safe. Go well. <laughs>